All right, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here today, or maybe thank Pastor Fawn Miller. Uh, my name is Kevin Callahan. I grew up in New Freedom, Pennsylvania, and I grew up in New Freedom Baptist Church. Uh, the pastor was Mark Hopkins, who was good friends with Preacher Marks, and so I've known them throughout the years. Uh, Rod Bell, also, who's now with the Lord, uh, heard him preach many times in that church. And then um, as I got older, of course, I became interested in getting married. I met my wife at uh, Turnpike Baptist Church, which was in Shrewsbury, pastored by Richard Kidd. He was also a Bob Jones graduate. And uh, we've been married 35, a little bit over 35 years at this point. And uh, thankful for the, the wife the Lord's given me. And then he also led me, uh, I pastored for 18 years, but for the past 16 years have been leading uh, International Partnership Ministries, a mission board that's uh, basically headquartered in Hanover, Pennsylvania. And um, we concentrate or specialize in partnering with foreign nationals, uh, to especially to get the gospel and to plant churches in restricted access areas of the world that really aren't open to outside missionaries coming in. And so Pastor Fawn Miller said it'd be nice to have a, a missions emphasis or concentration today. And so I'm going to preach a message this morning entitled Stewards of the Mysteries of God. And that's coming out of 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2. That'll be our text as we start. Lord willing, tonight I'll, I'll also uh, bring a PowerPoint into my message and get a little more specific about what God's doing on the mission field. But let's begin here this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, verses 1 and 2. Uh, it says, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you, Lord, not only for inspiring it through the holy men of God that spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, but Lord, even preserving it for us that we can hold it in our hands today, that we can read it, that we can proclaim it, we can learn it, and we pray that the Spirit of God would be our teacher to guide us into your truth and, Lord, to apply it to our hearts, that we might walk out of this place in some way changed, uh, more conformed to the image of your Son, more in fellowship with you and one another, and more desirous to be used of you for your glory. We just commit this time to you and ask that you would work in it and work in us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, as we look at this passage, Paul says, here's how I want you to see me. He said, I want you to see me as a minister of Christ, one who serves him with my life. And then he uses a term that we don't use as much today, particularly outside of Christian circles, he said, let a man account of us as stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, we use the term stewardship as believers, often in, uh, connected with finances, and that's because we recognize that what we have is not ultimately owned by us, but it's owned by God. So a steward is a caretaker. He, too, is a type of servant. He is accountable to a master. But the master's things are committed to the care of the steward. A steward is a caretaker. He is overseeing and taking care of that which does not belong to him. It belongs to his master, and it's entrusted to his care. Now, Paul says here what he's a steward of, the mysteries of God. That means those mysteries aren't Paul's. They did not originate with him. Paul does write about them in the Word of God, but he writes about them as a steward. They are God's mysteries, and they were committed to Paul. They were committed to Paul because God knew that Paul would do the right things with those mysteries. And we'll talk more about that as the message unfolds. He says, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. 
Now, to understand, though, what he was a steward of, we need to define this word mystery. And so I would ask you to go just two chapters back, same context here, the same book, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning with verse 6. We're going to let the Word of God define what a mystery is. It says, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. We're, we're seeing uh, the lack of wisdom in the princes of this world, aren't we? We're, we're seeing that whole thing come to naught. And so the Lord is telling us here, when I'm talking about wisdom, I'm not talking about the kind of wisdom that the world possesses or that the leaders of the world possess. I've had the privilege of being in many nations. And I want to tell you, political leadership is messed up everywhere. It's, it's not just isolated to the United States, of course. That wisdom comes to naught. But look at the next verse. But we speak the wisdom of God. So we have the wisdom of the world. Now we have the wisdom of God. And notice it says, the wisdom of God is in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom. So here's our first inkling or our first bit of a definition for a mystery of God. It says that because God's wisdom is in a mystery, it is hidden wisdom. So the first thing we learn about a divine mystery is that what's contained in that mystery is hidden. Notice it doesn't say that it's necessarily complex. What's, many, of the, many of the mysteries of God are quite simple. The message of the gospel is not difficult. In fact, Jesus said that don't get in the way of a little child that wants to come to me because you have to enter the kingdom of God as a little child. And many of the things, there are very complex things in the word of God, but the things that we need to embrace in order to be saved, the gospel message is simple. The problem is not that the message is complex. The problem is that the message is hidden. It's covered up. It's unknown. That's what makes it a mystery. And we'll say more about that. But you see here that the mysteries of God are things that are hidden, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Notice not just His glory, but our glory. There's something glorious about these mysteries, and it's a glory to us when God opens and unlocks those mysteries, uncovers them, that we may understand them. Now notice again in verse 8, the princes of this world. It says they did not know the wisdom of God, for if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So clearly a mystery is that which is hidden. It may not be complex truth, but it's not available truth. Now, how many of you at some point in your life have ever played hide and seek? Some of you probably still do, right? Now, when you're playing hide and seek and you're looking for someone, what are the two senses? We have five senses, but what are the two that you use primarily in hide and seek? Yes, sir. Yes. Eyes and ears. That's exactly the right answer. You use your eyes and ears to find that which is hidden. So remember, the mysteries of God are things that are hidden. And what do we use to find things that are hidden? We use our eyes and our ears. So look at verse 9, the very next verse. As it is written, which two senses? Eye hath not seen, nor ear heard. Do you know what God is telling us here under divine inspiration through the Apostle Paul is that you're not going to find the mysteries of God the same way you find other things that are hidden. You can use your physical eyes, but you'll never see the mysteries of God. You can use your, your physical ears, but you will never with them discover the hidden mysteries of God. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man. 
You can't think your way to the mysteries of God. You can't intellectually discover them. And he says, the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. That's encouraging too to know John 14. He's gone to prepare a place for us, right? And he tells us a little bit about it. But this passage tells you you could never comprehend what he's preparing for us. Your eyes have never seen anything like it. Your ears have never heard anything like it. And your mind has never imagined anything like that which God is preparing for us. What a thought. But the passage moves beyond that to all the things of God. Notice verse 10. God hath revealed these mysteries unto us by His Spirit. So now here's the second thing about a divine mystery or the mysteries of God, number one, those things are hidden. Can they be discovered by the natural man? Yes or no? No. So if God, if if there's knowledge about God that's hidden, I'm never going to discover it apart from verse 10, they are revealed by God's Spirit. So a mystery is that which is hidden from us until God decides to reveal it by His Spirit. Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. If you write in your Bible, I would encourage you to write in verse 11, the things of God knoweth no man. There's a lot of religions in the world, aren't there? You see, this passage also gives us the necessity or the why of missions. Why do we need missions? The reason we need missions is because the only people who can uncover the truth of the one true God are people who already know Him. If you don't already know God, He's a mystery to you. He is hidden to you. He might be a swear word. You might say Jesus was a great prophet. He was a good man. But you are not going to know the one true God of the Bible, the one who created us, the one who sent His Son to pay the penalty for our sin in our place, that penalty of death on the cross, to redeem us back to God, to put us back in fellowship with the God who made us. This is what every human being needs. He's created in the image of God to fellowship with the God who created him, but he can't even know that God because he's fallen in sin. He's living in spiritual darkness. He is spiritually dead to the things of God. He needs the Spirit of God to awaken, to illuminate his heart, to make him aware of divine truth and the nature of the one true God. Missions is needed because all that fallen, sinful human beings discover about God is false. And that's why we have so many false religions. Hindus have over 300 million gods. Even the only other monotheistic religion, major one in the world, is Islam. And their view of God is all messed up. They don't have true divine revelation. It's darkness. He's not a God of love. He's not a God of forgiveness. He's not a God of redemption. He's not a God you can know personally and fellowship with. We need missions because the one true God is a mystery to the natural man. He has to be revealed by His Spirit. And so notice verse 12. Now we, that is those of us who know the Lord, we have received. Now remember we saw the wisdom of the world 
And we saw the wisdom of God. Now notice we're going to see two spirits. We have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. So sometimes, as we said, not only are the things of God not complex, but they're not costly either. Notice they're freely given to us of God. Do you know every time you open up your Bible, you don't pay a tuition? And you don't even have to go anywhere to see a professor. The teacher is inside you. The one who authored the book, verse 12 says, He dwells in us. We've received Him. He lives in us. And so the one who authored the Word of God indwells, inhabits the believer, and guides us into that truth so that we can know our God and we can know about Him, the things that He reveals to us, and it's all free. It's freely given to us of God. But most of the world doesn't know this. So God, through His Spirit, must uncover the mysteries of Himself and reveal Himself to us. Supernatural, Divine revelation, then, is the second element of a mystery. It's that which is hidden until God reveals it by His Spirit. And until that happens, no one can know the mystery. There's no other way to discover it. And so we see in verse 13 that we speak these things. We do that when we witness. We do that when we come together in church. I'm speaking the mysteries of God right now. Because we couldn't know the very things we're talking about right now if God had not revealed them to us. How were they revealed to us? By a man who was a good steward. The Apostle Paul. He said a steward has to be faithful. The Apostle Paul, faithfully unto death, recorded the things that the Spirit of God inspired him to write. You know how we know the mysteries of God today? Because of faithful stewards, like the Apostle Paul, used of God under divine inspiration to give us the Word of God. And then he says, again, these things we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. There we see him as our teacher, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So we see then that this doesn't just apply to the things that God has prepared for us. It applies to to all the things about God. The things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. And so all that applies to the one true God of the Bible, there is natural revelation. It's given to us in creation. But special revelation, the specific truths of God, are given to us through the special revelation of His Word. And that is how the mystery is uncovered. Now let's look at the example, an example of a specific mystery in Ephesians chapter 3. You, know, you may recognize that the theme of the book of Ephesians is the church. And so when we come to Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, The Apostle Paul, and he identifies himself as the human author here, he said, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. Notice Paul saying, I'm here for you. This becomes important. He says, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, we call the church age, the age of grace. And notice he says, which is given me to you word. This is the second time that Paul has said, This is for you. I'm imprisoned for you. And I've been committed the dispensation of the grace of God for you. 
for your benefit. Do you see a stewardship idea here? Paul's saying, I'm possessing some things, and I'm experiencing some things, and I have knowledge about some things, but it's not just for me. It's for you. And so he's recognizing that part of his caretaker responsibility is to take what God has committed to him and make it available to others. He's, he's hinting at that, but it's going to become more obvious. Look at verse 3. He says, How that by revelation he made known unto me what? Do you see the elements here? Okay, so Paul, by divine revelation, God made known to him a mystery, and then he says, as I wrote a four in few words. So that mystery didn't stay with Paul. He wrote about it. We're reading it right now. Verse four, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. Question here in verse 5. Why was it not made known? It was still hidden, and God had not yet revealed it. So this thing that Paul's writing about, this mystery that he's writing about, he says, in other ages it was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by what? The Spirit. Do you see all the elements of a mystery here? That which was not known in the past because it was hidden, but now it is revealed unto us to... Who was it revealed to? His holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So God didn't just reveal it to all believers. He revealed it to select ones. His holy apostles and prophets by His Spirit. Here is the definition of that mystery. The next verse, verse 6. Here it is. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. The definition of the mystery or the content of this mystery was, what, was that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. Fellow heirs with whom? With the Jews. When you come into the New Testament and you're looking there in the book of Acts, the early church, right? Church begins at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. The Spirit of God descends as, as was promised, sent by the Father and the Son. He indwells them. The sign of that, the early sign, as, as those people groups, the, the Spirit of God was coming even upon the Gentiles. They spoke in tongues so that the Jews would recognize outwardly Hey, we don't just have the Spirit of God. They do too. And the Jews got excited about the Gentiles getting saved, but at first it wasn't the right kind of excitement, was it? It was an antagonistic kind of excitement. Because the Jews were the privileged people. They were the chosen race. They were the descendants of Abraham. They were the ones uniquely in covenant relationship with God all through the Old Testament. God was not primarily dealing with Gentiles. There's a sprinkling of Gentiles that get saved. We see them even in the Old Testament scriptures. But God was primarily giving his attention to those blood descendants of Abraham. And they knew they were the privileged people and they were proud of it. The problem was they weren't in fellowship with God. They lacked faith even all through the Old Testament. They were constantly backsliding and turning away from God and worshiping false gods. And by the time we get into the New Testament, the, the, the synagogue and the, the synagogues and the temple are given over to basically human tradition. They had added all kinds of human things to God's truth. 
So when their Messiah came along, they rejected him. This is not our Messiah. And so when God opened the door for Gentiles to receive the Jewish Messiah, in fact, Hebrews 11, or Romans 11 says that God did it to provoke them to jealousy. <laughs> and you can almost see that jealousy in the book of Acts, even amongst believers. This, this, this is our God. This is our Messiah. He doesn't belong to them. And so when God starts bringing in Gentiles, the point here is that they are fellow heirs. They're on equal plane now with the Jews. God brings them into the same kind of covenantal relationship. Now, the church does not replace Israel. Just so you understand, I don't believe that. I'm a dispensationalist. And Romans 11 says there is a future for Israel. And they will recognize their Messiah. He will land on the Mount of Olives. They'll look on Him whom they pierce. And they'll believe in a day. And I believe all that. I believe it literally. But it doesn't change the fact that in the church, Jew and Gentile are now equal. There's no special privilege of being a Jew in the church. Jew and Gentile are one in Jesus Christ. And it's that fellow heirs and the same body, notice, partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. The Jews got upset about this because this was still hidden truth to them. Those early Jewish believers, they're part of the church, but they do not yet understand that Gentiles will be one with them because it was still a mystery. That's what Paul's telling us in Ephesians 3. It hadn't been revealed yet. And they're not going to discover it until God reveals it. And so Paul says, this is, the, this is what God committed to me, the mystery of the church. And so he says in verse 7, I was made a minister of this mystery according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power unto me who am the less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Notice he says they're unsearchable riches. Why are they unsearchable? What are the last three words of verse 4? Mystery of Christ. Do you understand that Jesus Christ, just like God, He is God, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Christ, the identity of Jesus Christ is a mystery to our world. Again, they might say he's a good prophet. They might say he's a great teacher. They might say he was a wonderful martyr. He was a wonderful example. But the true identity of Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, one with the Father, that is a mystery. Even after we're saved, there's still mysterious elements to the Trinity, are there not? I can't understand how they're three in one and yet they're distinct. You can't say the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the same person. They're distinct persons. But you can't say they're distinct beings. They're one being, one God in three distinct persons. So it's right to say they're three, but it's also right to say they're one. They're three in one. There's still a mystery to that. But we can believe it as it's revealed to us in the pages of Scripture. So Paul says, This was given that I might preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. They're unsearchable because Christ is a mystery. We see earlier in the passage, And the mysteries of God cannot be searched and found by the natural man, but they can be preached. 
And Paul, he said earlier that he wrote about these mysteries. Now he says he's preaching about them to the Gentiles. Why? To make all men see, in verse 9, what the fellowship of the mystery. Now remember, what is the mystery here? The mystery is the church. The church isn't in the Old Testament. Covenant theologians can say whatever they want to say. The church is not in the Old Testament. Paul says it was not yet revealed to them. Isaiah couldn't write about the church. Jeremiah couldn't write about the church. Ezekiel couldn't write about the church because the very Spirit of God who was inspiring them to write had not yet revealed the mystery of the church. That's what Paul's saying in Ephesians 3. He's saying, God revealed it to me. This idea that Jew and Gentile would be made one in Christ and be brought into the same body, that body of Christ composed of Jew and Gentile believers, that body is called the church. It's the called out assembly of believers made up of Jew and Gentile, a mystery in the Old Testament. But Paul said, I preached it so that all men might see what is the fellowship of the mystery. How many of you feel like when you come here, you enjoy fellowship with one another? Isn't it wonderful? And you know what's so wonderful about it? All of you know the same mystery. It's almost, I, it's almost like this is a hidden secret club. It's not. But once you walk out there, God's still a mystery to those people. You, you don't have fellowship with God because they don't know your God. They've not been redeemed by your Savior. They're not saved by the blood of Christ. They're not in fellowship with Him. When they read the Word of God, the Holy Spirit is not their teacher to illuminate the truths of Scripture. That's all special to you. And so when we come together, we have fellowship in the mystery, the mystery of Christ, the mystery of God, the things that he has revealed to us. But I want you to see something else in verse 9. Verse 9 tells you who did the hiding. The same one who hides, the same one who reveals his truth to us is the one who hid it in the first place. Now, I know Satan's involved in hiding because Satan keeps people in deception. But I want you to understand something, that when we talk about the true mysteries of God, we need to understand why they're hidden. So I want us to go back again to hide and seek. And I want to ask you a simple question. When you're playing hide and seek, how do you win? You win by finding the person who's hiding, right? Right? But how do you win if you're the person who's hiding? You win by staying hidden, right? I was at uh, Camp Utibica years ago on a mission team west, Bob Jones University. This was in the early 80s. And um, Camp Utibica is uh, one of the camps out there in the mountains. Uh, and they have real mountains out there. I know this is Mountain View Bible Church, and I love that name. But if you've ever been out west, you know they have real mountains, and they laugh about what we call mountains. But anyway, I'm out there at Camp Utibica, and we're, uh, I was part of Mission Team West. And so uh, the people who were part of that team were acting as counselors for a week in this camp. And, and so I was one of them, and we played hide-and-seek. And so... The counselors were hiding, the campers were trying to find them. Well, I grew up playing hide and seek, and I knew you had to move around, you had to be aware of yourself. So I didn't just stay in one place, and, and they never found me. There were two people that they never found, and I was one of those people. And so we won by not being found. Do you understand that if God allowed the natural man to find him without the divine revelation of his spirit, who would win? Man would. So who would get the glory? 
man would. But God says, in my game of hide and seek, you can look for me as long as you want. You can look for me as hard as you want. You can search the religions of the world. You can go into the laboratories and libraries of the world. You can fill yourself to the brim with all the knowledge that the internet possesses. But if and apart from divine truth given by my spirit, you'll never find me. Because I'm not going to let you win the game of hide and seek. You will not find me until I reveal myself to you by my spirit. And so now that revelation is available on the internet. How and why? Well, there's plenty of the wisdom of the world on the internet, right? But there's also the wisdom of God. How? Because it takes the scriptures. These things that we're reading this morning. Paul says, I was what? A steward of the mysteries of God. How do we know God today? Paul had it revealed directly to him. What if he had not written it down? What if he had not declared it? Do you see the stewardship committed to Paul? So we see in this same passage... These things were hidden. They were revealed to Paul. Paul spoke about them. He wrote about them. So once God revealed these things to the Apostle Paul, he became a steward of them. God didn't say, Paul, I'm giving these things to you. So they moved from one hiding place to another hiding place. If Paul had kept all this to himself, the mysteries would still be mysteries. You following what I'm saying? God would have simply moved them from one hiding place to another hiding place. But Paul said, that's not me. I'm a steward of this. And as a steward, I wrote about it and I preached it. And he made it known, the things of God to us. Now, I want you to move now to Ephesians chapter 6. And I want you to look at verse 19 because we're going to see that word mystery again. Ephesians 6, 19, Paul is asking for prayer. You say, a man like Paul needs prayer? Yes. Pray for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known what? The mystery of the gospel. So we have God as a mystery. Now we have the gospel as a mystery. Do you know that when you give the gospel to a person, most of them reject it? Certainly the first time. And you're thinking, this is so simple. I'm offering you the best thing. The, it's good news, right? That's what the word means. This is the best news ever. That, that somebody died in your place taking his sin, your sin, and, and your guilt upon himself. And he pays the wage of your sin, which is death, in your place. And he, in exchange for your sin, when you place your faith in him, he gives you God's righteousness, not your own. Your own righteousness is filthy rags. You can never work your way to God. But God not only forgives your sin through the finished work of Christ, but he grants you the righteousness of his son. He applies it to your account. You're justified in his sight. You're declared righteous by a holy God. And we say, why would someone not receive that? Why would they reject that? It's the mystery of the gospel. They need the Spirit of God to open their eyes. And notice Paul says, as simple as that gospel message is, he says, pray for me. I need utterance that I may boldly proclaim this message because there's a lot of people who don't want to hear it. And they will gladly put you to death even for boldly declaring the message of the gospel. Now, let's look at the gospel defined for us in 1 Corinthians 15. And I'm moving all of this in a direction right now because we're looking at why we need missions. 
We need missions because God is a mystery to the natural man. The gospel is a mystery to the natural man. Will they ever discover it on their own? Yes or no? No, they never will. So without a Bible, without a preacher, they'll never know God. That's why we have the Great Commission. That's why we preach the gospel to every creature. That's why we make disciples of all nations. We'll look more specifically at that tonight. But we're laying a foundation this morning that God is hidden. His truths are hidden. The gospel is hidden. It's a mystery. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I received. And here's the content of it, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Paul said this is the content of the Gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, historical facts, they're revealed to us, though, too, in the Word of God, and he says this is the Gospel. Now, he called this a mystery, though. We saw that in Ephesians 6, and let's see what the mystery is here. He says... I declare unto you the gospel which I have preached unto you, you received, which also wherein ye stand. And he says in verse 3, I delivered unto you that which I also received, how that Christ died. Now let's stop right there. It's no mystery that Christ died. It's a historic fact that Christ died. In fact, you can even go into the Holy Land today and see an inscription about Pontius Pilate, the one who put him on trial through the Roman government, and said, I find no fault at all in this man. So, it's no mystery that he died. So, let's take ourselves with just that fact, that Christ died. I want you to pretend you don't have a Bible. And I want you to put yourself at the crucifixion. What would you have observed there? Well, you would have observed an anxious Roman governor. He's maybe pacing, I don't know, but he's doing what he can to get the people to release Jesus of Nazareth. He doesn't want him to be put to death. He's been warned of God, his wife, and, 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 and his wife says, this is a just man. You don't need to be doing this. And he, and, and, but yet, what is the crowd doing that day? The crowd is saying, crucify him. Crucify. We have no king but Caesar. He calls himself the king of the Jews. No, he's not our king. Caesar is our king. And you would have noticed that the people crying that the loudest were actually the most religious. And you would have stood there and you would have thought, what's going on? Why is this crowd so bloodthirsty to crucify an innocent man? Because this is a heinous death. It's full of incredible suffering. It's full of incredible mockery and shame as the victim is stripped bare. And, he's, and he hangs there for hours, struggling to breathe, dying an agonizing death. And you're going to do this to a man who's innocent? And the religious leaders are the ones who are most loudly crying for it to happen? And sure enough, it happens, and you're still observing this. You're dumbfounded. You can't understand. And then you hear him cry out. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And if you could understand his language, you would have thought, this man's not only rejected by all the religious leaders out here, but God himself has rejected this innocent man at the point of his death. 
And then you would have heard him, the last thing he would cry is, It is finished! Again, you would have thought, what does it mean? What did he finish? Does he just mean his earthly life is over? And do you see, you could have been right there at the death of Christ. You could have observed all that happened, but you couldn't have connected the dots. But there's three words revealed to us in this passage, Christ died. What are the next three words? For our sins. Do you understand they illuminate all that happened that day? The reason that he had to be declared innocent through not just one trial, but Gentile and Jewish trials, not just the Roman government. There was no fault in him, and that had to be made public because he couldn't die for our sins if he was also tainted by them. This was the Lamb of God, without spot and without blemish. To die for our sins, he had to have none. And that was declared that day. And why then did the crowd cry out for his death, including the religious leaders? Because... He was not dying for good people. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And Romans declares that all of us are sinners, even the religious ones. And they had to make known that day, not only that that day in history, not only made known that this man up in front of them was innocent, but also that he was the only one who was innocent. The rest of them, all of them, including the religious leaders, were sinners. And that's the very ones for whom he was dying. What love! And then, when he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When you understand he was dying for our sins, it makes sense. Because the most basic thing we know about sin is that it separates us from God. And when the Son of God took our sin upon himself, he was, this again is the mystery of the Trinity. I can't understand it. But the Son was separated from fellowship with his Father, which he had known for all eternity. He's pleasing the Father in his death, yet he's separated from fellowship with his Father because he's bearing your sin and he's bearing my sin. He was there alone, rejected by all, including God the Father, because it was for our sins. And when he said it is finished, you can even understand that when you understand he was dying for our sins. The whole sacrificial system was now done. It was completed in him. He had fulfilled the law. He had fulfilled all the types in the Old Testament. All those sacrifices laid on altars. That's gone. It's done. It's finished in him. Praise God. Hallelujah. But do you see how his death would have been a mystery without three words for our sins? It comes alive because we have divine revelation to unlock the mystery. And then we're near our close now. Paul says that this gospel is one that he received. Do you see that? He said, I'm delivering unto you this gospel which I also received. I'm being a little informal tonight. I've asked some questions. Where and how did Paul receive that gospel? Directly from Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, right? Paul may have heard it before, We know that Paul stood and witnessed the stoning of Stephen, the first martyr in the New Testament. He authorized it. They laid down their cloaks at his feet. Paul 
had seen believers. He had seen their testimonies. He may have heard the gospel. But Paul was not saved through any human messenger other than the God-man, Jesus Christ. And that was after his ascension into heaven. The light of the glory of, of the risen Christ blows him off his horse. He's on the ground. He hears that he's been persecuting Jesus Christ through the persecution of believers. And that day on the road to Damascus, he understands the truth of the gospel, the identity of Jesus Christ, receives him as Savior and even as Lord. And he says, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And God anoints Saul to be the Apostle Paul. And he rightly identifies himself as an Apostle. Because an Apostle, this is what you have to, and I know you do understand it. This is a good Bible-believing church. Has been for many years. An Apostle does not have a human being in between himself and God. An Apostle knows God directly. The disciples walked with Jesus Christ. They, they, John even says in, in John 1, we held him, our hands touched him, we saw him with our eyes. There was no one in between them and God. God in flesh revealing himself to them personally. Same thing happens to Paul, born out of due time. It happens after Jesus Christ has already ascended. But Paul hears and receives the gospel directly from Jesus Christ, not from any other human man. In fact, let's go to Galatians 1. This is the passage we'll close with. Galatians 1, verse 11. He says, I certify you, brethren. Remember, he talked about the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15. Now in Galatians 1, verse 11, he says, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not what? It's not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Obviously, he's talking about the road to Damascus experience. How did I get the gospel? Not from any man. I got it directly from Jesus Christ. This is what makes him an apostle. For you have heard of my conversation in time past, the Jews' religion beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, profited my Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation being exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb. Here's a good anti-abortion passage. Really good one. God knew Paul long before Paul knew God. <laughs> Paul didn't know he's going to be doing this with his life, but God did. When did God separate him unto his ministry? Mother's womb. Powerful passage. Can't park there, but you get it. He called me by His grace. That's the only way He calls anybody. It's all by His grace. Saved by His grace, served by His grace. To reveal His Son in me, that I might preach Him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Do you understand what Paul's saying here? He's saying even after I was saved, I wasn't discipled by the other apostles. I went into the desert. Who was teaching Paul in the desert? Same Jesus that talked to him on the road. To, isn't it? No question about this. How did he get all the mysteries? He didn't get them from Peter. He didn't get them from James and John. He didn't get them from Luke or Matthew. He got them from Jesus Christ. He said, God may... God gave these mysteries to me. He uncovered them by His Spirit. And now I'm revealing them to you. It was three years till he went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. And Peter's the one who wrote that Paul wrote things that were hard to understand. So even when he got together with Peter, who do you think was teaching whom? I don't think Peter had a lot to say to Paul. I think Paul had more to say to Peter, don't you? They're both apostles. But see, Peter, Paul even had a thorn in the flesh. You know why? He tells you why. There was an abundance of revelations given to him. 
Paul had more truth committed to him than any other apostle, probably than any other author of Scripture, period, human author. But here's what we got to realize as we close. Paul was a steward. And what did he do with all that God committed to him? He says he did two things. He wrote it down and he preached it. And you know what? We're not getting new truth committed to us today. But see, here's what you have to understand. The apostles were first generation. If they had dropped the ball, who else could know God? What's the answer? We'd still be trying to find him, right? Because he revealed himself to them through his spirit. Paul says, nobody would have known about the church until the Spirit of God revealed it to me. And I wrote it to you. Isaiah didn't know about it. Ezekiel didn't know about it. Paul knew about it. And Paul was a faithful steward. If I were to ask you as we close, who wrote the Word of God, what would you say? You could say God and you'd be right. You could say man. And you'd still be right. Because God wrote it through men, right? Those men had to write it or we wouldn't have it. Which one could you take out of the equation? You can't take God out of the equation and have a Bible, but you can't take man out of the equation and have a Bible either. Every page of that book has both a divine and a human imprint because it's inspired by men who were moved by the Holy Ghost. And those men were required to be faithful, and thank God they were. In the same way, if I said to you, is Jesus Christ God or man, what would you say? He's both. The God-man is the living word, and the written word is written by God through men. You can't take either one away from either one and have the truth. And so we now are stewards of the mysteries because we've been privileged to come to Christ because the Apostles and prophets wrote down the truth. We've received it. We're now stewards. So tonight, we're going to talk about what we need to do, and we're going to look at some examples. I'm, I'm going to show you some things in a PowerPoint, some things that great prices that are still being paid today for people to be faithful stewards of that which God has enabled them to know, his mysteries through his word. Thank God we have them today. As we close in a word of prayer, I'm not going to give a, a come forward invitation or anything of that sort, but I'm just going to have a little period of silence right now for you to think about the idea that you are a steward of the mysteries of God. Not exactly like Paul was. You're not an apostle. If we were to take time, and I'm sure it would be wonderful to take um, testimonies this morning. You could tell us about the person who led you to Christ. The person who first shared the gospel with you. You're not an apostle, and I'm not an apostle, and God's not giving us new truth. But we need to praise God we know the existing truth. We need to praise God that the Holy Spirit opened our eyes to enable us to understand the truth of His Word, that He convicted our hearts to know that we were sinners. And we need to understand there's people in our neighborhoods, there's people in our schools, there's people in our places of employment to whom God is still a mystery. And they do need a human messenger. Romans 10 says, how shall they hear without a preacher? And so will we commit ourselves to God in this closing time to say, God, I know that you want me to be a faithful steward 
as Paul was. Not of new truth, but of existing truth that's still hidden to lost people. And God, I have the light. Help me not to put it under a bushel. Help me not to be ashamed. Give me boldness, Lord, to be a witness for you. Help me to write it, maybe on pages of the internet. Help me to take it to my neighbors, to my friends. God, help me to be a faithful steward. Lord, I thank you today for your word. I thank you for this definition from your word of a mystery. It's that which is hidden. Not only is it hidden, but you're the one who hid it. Because, Lord, you won't allow us to know you, to find you, apart from your own revelation of yourself. That enables you, Lord, to be the winner. That enables you to receive the glory. And through all eternity, we will be giving you the glory, not only for creating us, but for redeeming us. And for the Spirit of God to give us your truth in written form. And then to guide us and illuminate us as we read it to know your truth. Lord, help us not to hide it. There's darkness all around us. Our nation our nation's darker than it's ever been. Help us, Lord, to properly steward the light of your truth. Give us the boldness. Give us the love. Give us the understanding of stewardship and help us to be found faithful. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.